So let's go ahead and pray. Dear Lord, we love you. We thank you for this wonderful day. Thank you for everybody being here. We thank you for um, hearing a scripture from the Carters. And we just pray for the Cornerstone Church. And we just thank you again for this day, everybody being here. And we thank you, Lord, for dying for all of us and our sins. And we love you, dear Lord. And I just pray that you bring the Pastor Dan with a message and make sure we can hear it good, dear Lord. In your great name I do pray. Amen. All right, well. Mine's similar to what we're reading today, so Psalm 18. We'll start there first. I got to get there first, too. All right, starting at 37, I'm going to read a few verses. I have pursued mine enemies and overtaken them, neither did I turn again till they were consumed. I wounded them that were not able to rise, they are fallen under my feet. For thou hast girded me with strength unto battle, and thou hast subdued under me that rose up against me. Thou hast also given me the necks of mine enemies, that I might destroy them that hate me. They cried, but there was none to save them, even unto the Lord, but he answered them not. Then did I beat them as small as the dust before the wind. I did cast them out as dirt in the streets. Thou hast delivered me from the strivings of the people, and thou hast made me the head of the heathen. A people whom I have not known shall serve me. As soon as they hear of me, they shall obey me. The strangers shall submit themselves unto me. The strangers shall, shall fade away and be afraid of their close places. found some verses that correlate with what I just read, so I'm just going to read them. You can write it down if you want to, or just follow along. In uh, Job 27.9, it's the, the cover later verse, Psalm 1841, Will God hear his cry when trouble comes upon him? In Proverbs chapter 1, starting 23 through, through 29, God says, Turn you on my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you, and I will make known my words unto you. Because I have called and ye refused, I have stretched out my hand, and no man regarded. But ye have said at naught all my counsel, and with none of my reproof. I will also laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear comes, when your fear comes as desolation, and your destruction comes as a whirlwind. When distress and anguish comes upon you, they shall call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. For that they hated knowledge, and did not choose fear of the Lord. Now, Zechariah 10.5, the co-verse, Psalm 18.42. And they shall be as mighty men which tread down their enemies in the mighty streets in battle. They shall fight, because the Lord is with them, and the riders, and the riders on horses shall be confounded. Eight, in 1843, the, another verse I found, actually it's a whole chapter, is Second Samuel chapter 8. I'm going to flip over to right quick. I won't read all, all chapter 8 because there's quite a few words I can't pronounce, so I'm going to spare y'all's y'all's hearing. I'll let Dan do that. Um, so in, uh, in chapter 8, verse 6 and 14, two things that stuck out which really got to me. It says, The Lord preserved David whithersoever he went. That's in both of them. So wherever David went, God was with him no matter what. You can read chapter 8 in your own time. You know, I was, you know, also, same verse, Isaiah 52, 15. It says, So shall he sprinkle many nations, the kings shall, shall shut their mouths at him. For that, which had no, for that which had not been told them, they shall see, and that they which had not heard, shall they consider. All, right. All the way over to Romans chapter 1, I'll just read it. It's 18 and 19. It said, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Behold a truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. You know, now going back to the Old Testament, Micah first chapter seven. It said, The nations shall see and be confounded at all their might. They shall lay their hand upon their mouth, their ears shall be deaf. They shall look to dust like a serpent. They shall move out of the holes like worms of the earth. They shall be afraid of the Lord our God, because shall, and shall fear because of thee. 
I find this to be the little transition from being dark and heavy and like, what's, is there hope? Well, eight, Micah 7, 18. Who is a God like unto thee that pardons iniquity and passes by transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retains not his anger forever because he delights in mercy. He will turn again. He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities. Thou will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. In Proverbs 3, 4 through 6, So shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man, and trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. Thank you, Wesley. Appreciate that. You know, in Colossians 1, to add on to the, the goodness of the Lord, actually he's adding this, his goodness on to us, not the other way around. And that Colossians 1, 10 through 14, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with might according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Our next hymn is number eight in the book. Uh, a mighty fortress is our God. If you can remain seated on this one. Number eight.
and turn to 400, 400. Rise up, O men of God, 400. The God who gave me vengeance and subdued peoples under me, who rescued me from my enemies. Yes, you exalt me above those who rose against me. You delivered me for the man of from the man of violence. For this I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations, and sing to your name. Great salvation he brings to his king and shows steadfast love to his anointed, to David and his offsprings forever. <laughs> Let's go, Lord, in prayer. Father, we would ask that you would give us understanding of this passage of scripture. That we would see, Father, not just your power in David's life, but that we would see your power over sin and death in your Son, Jesus Christ. And Father, that we would leave here believing and trusting in Jesus Christ. We pray that you would use this passage of Scripture to strengthen your people and give us victory, Father, over sin. We pray that you would exalt Christ. And that those here that do not know him today would turn from their sins and believe in Christ. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. 
As we finish up the chapter here, we're going to be looking at this passage of Scripture in three different interpretations. We're going to go through it three different times. And we're going to be looking at it for the historical interpretation, and that is what God did in David's life. And then we're going to go through it from the actual interpretation, and that, that is, this is actually about Jesus and his defeat of sin and death. And then we're going to go back and look through it from a personal application in terms of what it means for you and me today. As we've been looking at Psalm 18, we have seen that this is David recounting how God has delivered him. Um, and if you go back and read First and Second Samuel, uh, I appreciated what Ted shared this morning from Second Samuel, another passage of Scripture. You'll see exactly what we're talking about here. If you've not read David's life story, um, this will not make near as much sense as if you're familiar with David's life story. And if you understand David's life story, this whole we're going to get makes so much sense. So I'm going to kind of go through from verse 37 on and kind of just go back to different things from David's life that encourage you, if you are not familiar with them, to go back and read First and Second Samuel. In verse, 40, uh, verse 37, he says, I pursued my enemies and overtook them. Now, when we talk about pursuing enemies, what has just happened in this passage of Scripture, literally just taken place, is the Amalekites had come while he was off with the Philistines, had burned their city to the ground, kidnapped all of him and his, his, his mighty men, all of their wives and children, taken everything they owned and, and fled. The mighty men turned on David and were going to stone him, but David strengthened himself in the Lord, and that night they pursued the Amalekites. That's what he's speaking of here. He pursued his enemies, and he caught up with them. It says in verse 37, he says, Neither did I turn again until they were consumed. They slaughtered every single one of them. Okay? They did not stop till the battle was over. Okay? Keep reading. Verse 38, I have wounded them that they were not able to rise. The word wounded is sometimes translated as thrust through. In other words, this is the knockout punch. I hit them once, they didn't get up again. And he's really speaking literally. They attacked them so fast and so hard that there was virtually no resistance. They hit the enemy so fast, so hard that they couldn't even fight back. I mean, it was the knockout blow that was the end. He gives the description in verse 39 of how he was able to have this victory. For you, that is God, have girded me with strength to the battle. You have subdued under me those that rose up against me. As we've seen constantly, David does not take credit for what takes place in his life. He gives all of the glory to God. God is the one who gave him the strength. God is the one who gave him the victory. God is the one who defeated his enemies. In verse 40, you have given me the necks of my enemies that I might destroy them and hate me. If you go back to the beginning of the psalm, it talks about this is the song he wrote when God delivered him from all his enemies. That's what he's referencing here. He is now king. He has now defeated all of those who've come against him. God in his grace and strength has defeated all of his enemies. In verse 41, it sounds a little weird because he speaks of his enemies crying and no one would save them. That makes sense. Someone crying out for help as you get literally run down by David and his mighty men. But then he says this, that they cried even to Yahweh. That is the God of Scripture. And he didn't answer them. Well, what is that referencing? Well, that's referencing Saul. Literally just a few days before this psalm was written, Saul was going to go fight the Philistines. And because of Saul's sin, his pride, his rebellion and arrogance, he is crying out to God and God refuses to answer him. And if you remember, he then goes to the witch at Endor to have Samuel called up from the dead. This is exactly what happened. Saul was pursuing David. He started praying, God, help me kill David, help me win, and God refused to answer him. That's what he's referencing there. Keep reading. Verse 42, Then I did beat them small as the dust before the wind. I cast them out as the dirt in the streets. He's speaking of the, 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 the victory that he's given. You go back and you look, and the casualties that David and his men suffered are virtually nil for most of his battles. I mean, you're talking like, a, you know, like just a wrecking ball that goes through and takes virtually no damage whatsoever. I mean, they just slaughter their enemies the same way that you would dust off your feet. That's the way David has been victorious. Verse 43, you've delivered 
from the strivings of the people. Yes, there was a lot of division and everything in Israel. You're going to find when David becomes king, they're still fighting for seven years between the, 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 the people who want Saul's son to be king and the people who want David's son to be king. And David is delivered from that and made king over the whole nation. Civil war is, 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 it comes to an end. And that's what he's speaking of here is God delivers him from all of the arguing and fighting among the people of God. He goes on and says, you have made me the head of the heathen. You look at David. David is the warrior king. Not just before he becomes king, but as king, he defeats all of his enemies. That was, that was the passage that, that uh, Ted was referring to there that you can go home and read on your own. It's how David slaughters everybody. And it's like one chapter. He defeats like all the nation surrounding them. And it's like one chapter, because it happened fast because of David's military might, because of God's grace and strength and power in David's life. And that's what he's referencing here when he speaks about subduing the heathen. He goes on and he says, he says, a people who I have not known will serve me. If you look at the territories and the countries and the people that David conquered in his kingdom, David conquered virtually anybody that was an earshot. Okay, anybody that would have been around. Okay, he, they became one of the most powerful nations in the world under David. Now Solomon kind of enjoyed some of it and then it went straight downhill after that. But historically, under David, Israel was probably the most powerful nation in the world for those few 40 years that he reigned. Okay, keep reading. As soon as they hear of me, they will obey me. What you will find is that many of the surrounding nations refused to fight David and said bow the knee and pay tribute. They didn't want to get slaughtered. They saw what he did to all the other enemies. And as soon as they saw David coming, it was like, hey, you want some gold? You want some silver? Leave us alone. We'll, we'll do whatever you ask. Okay. And, and again, David goes and takes all of this and begins to make stockpiles for Solomon's temple. Why do you think all of those people like Hiram were willing to do business with him? Because the other option, besides giving him all this stuff, was him coming and killing you and taking all this stuff. It's a whole lot better to give it than to have him come kill you and take it. Okay? Keep reading. He says, the strangers will submit themselves to me. It doesn't mean that they were exactly excited about it. Some of them say begrudgingly submit. But they did. Because they knew that God was with David. There was no withstanding David. There was no fighting back. There was either you bow the knee or you lose. Those were the only two options. Keep reading. Okay? The strangers will fade away and be afraid out of their close places. People would begin to run from David and his army. Why? Because he beat everybody he fought. Okay? Keep reading. The Lord lives. Blessed be my rock and let the God of my salvation be exalted. It is God that avenges me and subdues the people under me. Oh, David's a military genius. No, David serves a great God who has delivered David. Again, all of the glory goes back to God. Every single deliverance, every single battle, every single victory, every single nation subdued, David attributes to God, not himself. Verse 48, he delivers me from my enemies. Yea, you lifted me up above those that rise against me. You have delivered me from the violent man. Therefore will I give thanks to you, O Lord, among the heathen and sing praises to your name. Why is this written? Why does he write this? So that we, the heathen there would also be Gentiles, that those of us in here who are not Jews, which is almost every single person in here, okay, that we would hear the praises of God. And now, almost 3,000 years later, what are we reading? The praises of God for what he did in David's life. Okay, what David said has come true. We are singing from Psalm 18, we are reading from Psalm 18, and we are praising God for what he did in David's life. Now, verse 50, though, is very interesting. Because verse 50, he said, great deliverance he gives to his king. Okay, well, David's king, right? Okay. And shows mercy to his anointed. Now, we read that in English, and we go, okay, well, David was anointed king. The Hebrew word there is it says he showed mercy to his Messiah. That's actually what it says in Hebrew. His Mashiach. Okay. Was, is this meaning more than David? I'll keep reading. To David. Okay, well, that's David. And to his seed. And notice the term there is not plural. It is singular. It's speaking of a specific descendant of David. 
Now we know from reading about David and God's promises to David, one of the promises that was made to David is that one of his descendants would be the Mashiach, the Messiah, the Christ, the Anointed One. You see, if you look at those four people at the end, the psalm can kind of be about David, but David is very clear that this psalm is not really about David. This psalm is really about the one true king, who is the Messiah, who is, of which David is a type or a picture. Okay? It is God's Messiah, the Anointed One, the Son of David, who will rule and reign forever. It is about Jesus Christ. And if you go back and you read all the passage we just looked at, you actually read a description of Jesus. You do. You read a description of Jesus in his life. You remember when Jesus was talking to the people of his day, he told the Pharisees, you need to go back and read the Old Testament. You missed the whole point. Because the whole point of it, he said, is it testifies of me. Psalm 18 historically may be about David, but it's not really about David. Psalm 18 is really about God's Messiah, the seed of David, the descendant, the one true king. So let's go back and let's look and see whose life this really sounds like. It's the life of Jesus. Go back to verse 37. I have pursued my enemies and overtaken them. Oh, we, 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 this is where we're going to get into the personal application. We think of the enemies of God as Romans. Okay, that's what the, was the people of his time thought. Political opponents. But in reality, who was the enemy of the people of God? The world, the flesh, the devil. It was their pride. It was their self-righteousness. It was their sin. It was the powers and forces of darkness. What happened when Jesus was crucified? What happened when Jesus Christ rose again from the dead? He pursued his enemies overtook them and did not turn again until they were consumed. We read in 1 Corinthians that the last enemy to be defeated is death. When Christ rose again from the dead, what did he do to his enemy that is death? He crushed it. He destroyed it. You go in verse 38. I wounded them that they were not able to rise. Remember Genesis 3.15? When it talks about the snake? It says the snake will, will, will bruise his heel, but he will crush his head. What happens when you blow the head of a snake off? It ain't getting back up again. That's what happened when Jesus died. When Jesus rose again from the dead, he crushed his enemy to never rise again. Okay, keep reading. They are fallen under my feet. I wonder why he'd say under my feet. You will bruise his heel, he will crush your head. The idea, is, the idea here is Jesus' foot coming down on the head of Satan and literally trampling him to death. Keep reading. You have girded with me with strength to battle. You've subdued under me those that rose against me. Jesus on the cross looks defeated, but when Jesus rises again from the dead, what do we really know? We really know he defeated all of his enemies. They thought they had him. There were times when Saul thought he had David. There were times when Goliath thought he had David too. Jesus Christ, in his resurrection from the dead, defeats his enemies. Okay? You've subdued under me those that rose up against me. There were people who rose up against Christ. They were defeated by Christ's resurrection. Verse 40, you've given me the necks of my enemies that I might destroy them that hate me. Have you ever read a description of heaven? All that makes sin is not there. All of the powers of darkness are not there. Christ wins. Christ defeats them. In verse 41, they cried, but there was no one to save them. Go read Revelation. They will very, they'll cry out for the very rocks to cover them, to hide them from the Lamb who sits on the throne. He goes on and he says, he says, they cried even to Yahweh, the God of Scripture, but he did not answer them. Why was Jesus crucified? He was crucified by religious people, wasn't he? Who thought that they were doing Yahweh, the God of Scripture, a service by killing Christ. But who was God really on? Whose side was he really on? Christ. How do we know that? Because he rose again from the dead. 
Okay? You keep reading. Verse 42, I beat them as small as the dust before the wind. I cast them out in the dirts in the streets. Have you ever read in Revelation where Christ comes riding in on his white horse? And all the armies of the world are gathered against him, and it's almost like he goes, poof, and they're gone. That's what he's being referred to here. It's a complete and total victory of Jesus Christ. Keep reading. Verse 43, you've delivered me from the strivings of the people. You've made me the head of the heathen. Okay? Christianity began with a bunch of Jews. Very few people even realize that today because the vast majority of Christians are Gentiles. And who is our head? Jesus Christ, the King of the Jews. We have bowed the knee to him. Okay? He has been victorious. Keep reading. He says, a people who I have not known will serve me. That's exactly what the prophets talked about. Okay? How, how th th there was going to be a rejection of Christ by his own people. He came unto his own, but his own received him not. Okay? So what happened, though, when the gospel went to the Gentiles? What happened with Cornelius? What happened with all of Paul's missionary journeys? Who was it that received the gospel gladly? It was the Gentiles. It was the pagans. That's exactly what Psalm 18 said would happen. The, the people who did not know of Jesus, did not know of the word of God, did not know of who God was, would bow the knee to God's anointed king. Keep reading. It says, as soon as they hear of me, they will obey me. I mean, have you ever marveled at how quickly Christianity went around the globe? How fast Christianity spread? You realize the day Christianity was quote-unquote founded, okay, if you want to go to Pentecost, 3,000 people came to faith in Christ as soon as they heard the gospel. What happened to Cornelius? How many times did he have to hear the gospel? While Peter was still telling him of Christ, the Spirit of God came on Cornelius and his family. Literally, as soon as they heard, they were brought under Jesus Christ and his rule. The strangers will submit themselves to me. Oh, there are people like Paul who begrudgingly bowed the knee. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It's hard for you to kick against the pricks. It's hard for you to kick against the goads. You don't need to tell me this. Okay, let me, let me just, just tell you this, point blank. Paul did not come <laughs> happily. He did not want to bow the knee to Christ. But the moment he met him, on the road to Damascus, what happened? He bowed the knee. You see, Psalm 18, yes, historically it's about David, but really, it's about Jesus. It's about the Messiah. You can keep reading about strangers fading away, being afraid out of their close places. Again, they will run to the caves, we read in Revelation, to hide from God's returning Messiah. It is God that avenges me, Okay, where, where, did, where did Jesus leave his vengeance? When Jesus was on the cross dying, did he pronounce a curse on those who crucified him, or what did he do? He said, Father, forgive them. And then what did he say? Into your hands I commit my spirit. Who is the one who vindicated Christ? God vindicated Christ by rising him from the dead. Okay? And subdues the people under me. That would make a lot of sense from what Jesus said in John 6. No one can come unless the Father draws them. Okay? How did they come to Christ? Because God subdued their hearts and brought them to him. Verse 48. He delivers me from my enemies. Yea, you lift me up above those that rise against me. You've delivered me from the violent man. The resurrection. All the violence that man could point towards God's anointed was defeated when Christ rose again from the dead. Again, talk about the historical interpretation. Okay, it's David. The actual interpretation is this is about Jesus. So what does this mean for me? Okay, when we read the Psalms, and this is where I really appreciated what Ted had to share this morning. When we read the Psalms, we read them backwards. Okay? We read this psalm as if we are David, the hero. The truth is, in this psalm, you are the heathen, you are the enemy. That's who you are. Okay? And so when we begin to look at this from its actual interpretation and see God's Messiah coming, we are the enemy 
okay, that must bow the knee fast to the Messiah before he wipes us off like dust off his feet. Okay, then we read this in Psalm 2. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. You see, our sin has made us rebels against a holy God. Our sin makes us standing and deserving of his wrath and deserving to be crushed to never rise again. But God in his grace sent his son Jesus Christ so that you might be forgiven. He has sent his son Jesus Christ so that if you will bow the knee, if you will come like the heathen here who came to David, if you will come, you will be spared. There is forgiveness found in Jesus Christ. There is welcome into the people of God. Then that's the first application of this. Is would you give your life to God's anointed one, his king, his Messiah, Jesus Christ? There's coming a day, go read Revelation, when it will be over. And you need to remember from Jesus' teachings in Matthew 7 exactly what is said in verse 41, and that is many will say in that day, Lord, Lord, they're going to cry out in the name of the Lord, and he's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. If you try to be right with God in any other way than Jesus Christ, you have no hope. The only hope for you and I to escape the complete and total victory that Jesus Christ brings is to come to him in simple faith and be on his side, not the one against him. This is why Jesus came. He came not to necessarily crush people, but to deliver us from the sin that enslaved us. And if you're here today and you are not a believer in Jesus Christ, the way to be on the side of the Messiah, who is victorious, is to turn from your sin and self-righteousness and believe in Jesus Christ and that your standing before God is based upon his life, his death, and his resurrection alone. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved and your house, as Layla quoted this morning. It is through faith in Christ you have the opportunity today to bow the knee as soon as you have heard of God's reigning King, Jesus Christ. But there's more to this than just an application for those who are not believers. For those who are believers in Jesus Christ, what we need to understand is that there is victory over our enemies in Jesus Christ. And the first thing we need to understand is what it says in Ephesians chapter 6, and that is we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. This is probably one of the greatest misinterpretations people have of spiritual warfare, is they think that the enemy is Russia, that the enemy is the Taliban, the Muslims, the enemy is the Democrats, the Republicans, the enemy is Obama, the enemy is Biden, the enemy is Trump. Okay. The enemy is this person. The enemy is that person. The enemy is that gossip over there, that slanderer over there, that adulterer over there. No, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, Amen. spiritual forces. The enemy of your soul is not another person. The enemy of your soul is sin. It is Satan. You see, the way we begin to look at it is we look and say, my enemy is is the Democrat or the Republican. No, your hatred of them is the enemy of your soul. Your refusal to love them is what's going to kill you. Your refusal to forgive it is what is going to destroy you. The enemy is not the person. The enemy is sin. That's the enemy. And this changes the way we look at our world. Because what Satan has done is he has pitted us against other people, co-workers, boss, family members. Oh, my mother. Oh, my father. Oh, this child. And then we, and we, what we do is we make these people the enemy. Oh, so-and-so. If only so-and-so would leave the church, we'd have a wonderful church. As if so-and-so is the problem. Okay? There are many churches that go, if we could just get rid of the preacher, we'd be okay. And there's many preachers that go, if I could just get rid of the deacons, we'd be okay. And there's many deacons that say, if we could just get rid of everyone else, we'd be okay. And that the enemy is not the people. The enemy's not the people. The enemy is the world, the flesh, the devil. The enemy is the spiritual powers that enslave us. 
And Jesus Christ came to set us free. You will call his name Jesus. Not because he'll save his people from communism, but he will save his people from their sins. That is what he saves his people from. Because that is the enemy of our soul. That is the enemy. And the truth be told, many of the physical people that you view as your enemy, as you fight them, you're not fighting the chains that are binding them. It is the lies that they believe, not them. It is the sinful actions, not the person. And this is, this is something that, that, that this is just some really practical advice for you. I, I deal with this all the time in marriage counseling. Is you begin to view your spouse as the enemy. Not the pride in your own heart. Not even the pride that's within them. And so instead of fighting for your spouse to be delivered from their addiction, instead of fighting for them to be delivered from their temper, you make them the enemy. No, the enemy is the darkness that binds them. I tell you, it happens in the church too. We fight against people, not the bitterness that has enslaved them, not the sexual sin that has enslaved them. Instead of fighting to see them delivered from their true enemy, we make them the enemy. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Now, this is where we've got to change the way we view sin. I want to spend a lot of time giving you a lot of illustrations, some parables in Scripture to help us understand this. Because a significant amount of the way we fight against sin is not just unbiblical, it's anti-biblical. And is not just not helpful, it's hurtful. You see, in... in, in I don't want to judge too much based upon the way we pray. But so often we pray for victory over sin. And don't even realize that that prayer in and of itself is unbelief. We just read of Christ defeating the enemy. The Christ has defeated the devil. The Christ has defeated sin by his death, burial, and resurrection. And we sit there and pray, God, would you please do something? God already has. That's the gospel. The gospel is God has already done something. One of my favorite stories, and, you, and this will all make sense as we go through this, one of my favorite stories Jesus tells is about the strong man, robbing the strong man. You all remember that story he talks about? I love that one. Because he says this, he says, you can't rob a strong man Okay? You can't. Why? Because he's stronger than you. Makes sense. Uh, when I was younger, I had a karate teacher um, who was, I think, seventh in the nation. Like, phenomenal karate guy. And some guys tried to jump him on the streets of St. Louis. Bad idea. They were in the hospital. Okay? Wrong person. It wasn't worth 20 bucks. Okay? Because you can't beat him. But what does Jesus say? How do you beat the strong man? How do you rob him? You have a stronger man come. And what does the stronger man do? The stronger man goes into the strong man's house. He takes the strong man and he ties him up. And then what can you do? You can take anything you want from the strong man's house because the stronger man has come and bound up the strong man. Okay? That's the gospel. Amen. If you go read in Ephesians chapter 2, we are under the power of Satan. We are under his control. We are, in essence, locked away in his dungeon. Jesus comes, takes the, the, the keeper of the dungeon, ties him up, rips the doors off the hinges, breaks the, the, the chains, and says, follow me out of the dungeon. And we go, God, would you please give me victory? He already has. Just follow Christ out of it. The issue is you don't believe that the doors are ripped off. We're like the church in Acts that's praying for Peter because he's in prison. God deliver Peter. God deliver Peter. God deliver Peter. And Peter comes and knocks on the door. Hey, I think Peter's outside. Nope. We're still praying for God to let him loose from prison. God already did. Do you remember that God sent an angel? The angel touched the, the chains. They fell off. He opened the doors and he walked Peter right out of the prison. You see, what holds us in is unbelief. We don't believe in a God who gives victory over sin. 
One, one of the, the, yeah, the, the, pastor's, the pastor's life is a lot of highs and a lot of lows. One of, one of the best days of my life was a young guy that was going to UF, um, and he was struggling with pornography. And we, we spent a lot of time talking, a lot of time talking with him. And it's just me and him, and we talk a lot about it. And throughout all the, the talk and all those type of things, there came a day when I was supposed to meet him at Sonny's over on 39th. And so I was meeting him at Sonny's, and I got there early, got a table, and he walked in, and I mean, he's a big guy, strong guy, athletic, but he looked like an idiot. He had the biggest grin on his face I've ever seen from somebody. And he just walked in, he's just like, it's gone. It's gone. I didn't know it was possible. It's like, what are you talking about? He's like, like the desire for pornography is gone. I, like, I, I've been, been walking freedom for a couple weeks. I didn't, I didn't even think you could do that. But you see, that's the issue. Is you'll get told from the pulpit that you'll fight this the rest of your life. No, Jesus already fought it and he won. It's truth. Go read in 1 John chapter 5. What is the victory that overcomes the world, the flesh, the devil, our sin? We sing a song about it called Faith is a victory. Faith is a victory. That's why I don't sing solos. Okay? <laughs> because the victory is faith. Now let me give you another illustration. Okay? And this comes from, in Romans, where it talks about us being slave to sin, talks about being set free, all those type of things. Let's imagine that you were born at like the late 1700s. And you were born in the United States, in the South, and you were black, and you were born on a plantation. The next 60 years, 70 years, what do you know? Slavery. All day, every day. Okay? When the master comes, calls your name, cracks the whip, you do what you're told, or you suffer the consequences. Now, let's say that you're 75 years old, and you hear the Civil War is over, Emancipation Proclamation, you are free to go. Well, it's a day to rejoice, isn't it? You'd be excited, wouldn't you? I, I, would, I would hope so. Now, let's say the next day, first day in your entire life, that you woke up free and you slept in to like 10 o'clock and you went outside and said, what am I going to do today? And you started walking down the road and your master comes walking up with a whip in his hand. Cracks that whip right next to your ear and says, get back in that field. What are you doing? Does that master have any power over you? No. Do you believe it in that moment? If you believe it, you can say, you're not my master anymore, and you turn around and walk off. If you don't believe it, what do you do? You go back and work for your master. Listen, there are many people who struggle with sin and don't even realize that their master's been defeated and that you are now a new master. And what it says in Romans 6, it says, sin shall not have dominion over you. That's what it says. That's a direct quote. Why? Because you have died, and the power of Satan over you has been crushed when Christ raised you with Christ to walk in newness of life. You are no longer his slave. Go read Romans chapter 2, or Ephesians chapter 2. You are no longer his slave. That being said, he still cracks that whip by your ear and says, do what I tell you to. And you actually think you have to obey. You see, the Christian life is a lot like Peter walking on the water. As long as you fix your eyes on Jesus, you can walk on the water. The moment you take your eyes off Jesus and quit believing in him, what happens? You immediately sink. Let me give you another illustration to help you understand this. Okay? I hope I don't offend any of you animal lovers or snake lovers. I hate, loathe, and despise venomous snakes. I do. Um, a couple months ago, I was counseling somebody, and uh, my phone rang, I saw it was Lydia, and, and you know, Lydia sometimes, you know, I'll have somebody stop by for counseling or whatever, and I've told her, you know, if it's, if it's ever an emergency, call twice. So I just said, yeah, okay, well, if it's an emergency, she'll call back. And then the church phone rang, I never answered that, and, you know, because Kathy's there, so she answers the church phone. And then she kind of comes in and rubs my session and says, uh, there's a rattlesnake on your front porch. 
Okay, so I literally grabbed a gun and just started running as fast as I could down there. Okay, and, and I was not in, in running clothes. I mean, I was running as fast as I could, and you know, found out that there was a, the, the dog had bait up a rattlesnake on the front porch, like inside the house. And I have a very well insulated house. You could hear that rattlesnake. I thought about bringing the rattles this morning to shake for y'all, just so you can get the real full effect. Okay. <laughs> I hate that sound. I absolutely despise the sound of rattlesnake rattles. Well, anyways, I finally get home. They've caught the dog. The dog did his job. He was a hero. The kids are all inside. And the snake finally starts moving off the porch. I don't want to shoot my house. So it, it, starts, it starts getting off the porch. And as soon as its head is off the porch clear of the house, that was the end of it. Okay? And I don't know if you've ever shot a rattlesnake with a 12 gauge from about three feet away, <laughs> there is literally not pieces of the head left. Like, I mean, there, there's nothing to pick up. But you know what happens when you cut the head off a rattlesnake? It still rattles. And, and, and I like to think of myself as a big strong man. I have never been able to touch a rattlesnake even with his head cut off, as long as those rattles are going. I just can't do it. I can't. Like that, that sound just literally gives me the heebie-jeebies. So I killed the snake, and then I got a pitchfork, a long one, to carry it and throw it in the woods. Because I'm not touching it. Even though it doesn't have a head, even though it doesn't have fangs, even though I blew the venom sacks into smithereens, it cannot harm me, it cannot hurt me, it cannot do anything, but when it shakes that rattle, it terrifies me. That is the Christian life. Satan's head has been crushed. He can't do anything to you if you're in Christ. He can't do anything, but boy, does he shake that rattle and make you think he can. And you go right back to your sin over and over and over again because you think he still can bite you. Turn to Romans chapter 8. I want you to read this with me. Actually, Romans chapter 7, okay? Everybody likes Romans chapter 7 because what, what does it say in Romans chapter 7? It says, things I want to do, I don't do. Things I don't want to do, that's what I do. And everybody stops right there because we all stop in verse 24 of Romans 7. Oh, wretched man that I am. How many of y'all have ever heard that? You know, you're supposed to pray every day. Oh, wretched man that I am, okay? But what's the rest of it in verse 24? Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me? And we just stop right there. As if Romans chapter 8 doesn't exist. Read verse 25. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Who's going to deliver me? Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. There is deliverance from the things I don't want to do. Okay? Notice what he says in, verse, in chapter 8 verse 1. I think this is one that Ashley quoted this morning. There is therefore no, now con no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Verse 2. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin. It says has. There is victory in Christ. Okay? You go on. Okay? For what the law could not do, verse 3, and it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. Notice it goes down here. It says here, um, let's skip down to... Oh, let's go. Verse 11. If the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken or make alive your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwells in you. Christ has defeated sin. Christ has given you a new nature. He has given you a new heart. He has delivered you. He has tied up the strong man. He has blown off the snake's head. He has crushed the snake's head. He has defeated. Go read, Roman, go read Psalm 18. He has defeated him. He has thrust him through so he will not rise again. He has trampled him under his feet. Satan has been defeated for the believer in Jesus Christ. Okay? Keep reading. Verse 12, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you will die. Verse 13, this, this, is, this is Psalm 18. You want to talk about a personal application. If you, through the Spirit, do mortify, that is to murder, that is to slaughter, that is to kill, that is to put to death, the deeds of the body, you will live. Because of Jesus Christ's resurrection from the dead... 
You are to put to death your sin and walk in freedom. You are to walk away from your sin. It can crack the whip. It can shake the rattle. He can scream all he wants. His head's been smashed. He's tied up. You are free in Christ. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, by faith in Jesus Christ, you can walk away. The problem is we look to our flesh for victory, not to Christ. We tell someone, hey, you're struggling with porn. Put a blocker on your phone. That's great. Okay, that's a good thing. Okay, hand offends, you cut it off. However, how is victory brought about? Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. You, you have two problems with your temper. Well, count to ten. Counting to ten will not solve the problem. It may help, but it won't fix it. The only way that you are going to have power over your, your, your temper or your lust or your pride or your greed or whatever it is your besetting sin is is by looking to Jesus Christ. It's through faith. It's through believing that that is not who you are. You are a new creature. The old things have passed away. You do not have to go back to the pig slop. You're not a pig anymore. You're now a son. You don't have to have those things. You can turn it off. You can shut it down. You can walk away. Because the strong man has been bound up. Satan's head has been crushed. You are now free in Jesus Christ. That's why... Later on in the book of Romans, Psalm 18, verse 49 is quoted. It's quoted in Romans 15, verse 9, saying this, Therefore, in light of this, in light of the victory of Jesus Christ over sin and death, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the Gentiles and sing praises to your name. And the way it is used in Romans 15 is to say that Gentiles today who believe in Jesus Christ are fulfilling what David said in Psalm 18, 49 by praising God for the new life and the victory over sin they have because Jesus Christ has defeated sin and given them the victory. That's what we're here for today. To give God the glory. To recenter our focus back on Christ to believe in his death, burial, and resurrection, to believe in his defeat of our enemy, Satan, of our enemy, self, of our enemy, sin, of our enemy, flesh, so that we could walk in newness of life. If you're a Christian here and you're struggling, okay, I, I'm not going to tell you that there's such a thing as Christian perfectionism because there's not. But I'm going to tell you this, there is something called sanctification where you can sin a whole lot less. Where the desire for sin can dissipate until it's no longer there. To where you can walk around with a big goofy smile on your face like that college guy because it's gone. You know how he defeated his sin? By meditating on Christ. Go read John 4. How did Jesus bring the woman out of her adultery? I am the living water. If you drink of me, you'll never thirst again. If you satisfy yourself in Christ, if your eyes are on Him, if you're looking to Him, like Peter, you can walk on the water till you take your eyes off of Him. And that's where we need to understand that whatsoever is not of faith is sin. We so often repent of the sin, but not the sin that led to it. And that is the sin of unbelief. I hope today as a, a Christian, you're encouraged. And I hope that you will join me and all the rest of the pagans in Romans chapter 15 in giving God the praise. Because we aren't what we used to be. <clears throat> And that is because of Jesus Christ. I'll share with you a, a painting I saw recently. I absolutely love the painting. One of the most awesome paintings I've ever seen. And it was a painting of just Jesus' feet on the cross. That's all it was. It was, it was the very base of the cross, and there was Jesus' feet, and there was a nail going through his feet. But at the very back, right between Jesus' feet and the cross, 
was a dragon biting Jesus' heel. And the nail went straight, straight through Jesus' heel, straight through the head of that dragon, and nailed it to the cross. That is what Christ has done through his death and resurrection. He has defeated your enemy. He has thrust him through so that he will not rise again. Praise God. Praise God. Amen.